Hey there. Did you know Kroger always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower than low prices? And when you download the Kroger app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Kroger today. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details. This episode is brought to you by Pepsi Wild Cherry. Pepsi Wild Cherry is bursting with delicious cherry flavor and a sweet, crisp taste that gives you more to go wild for. Getting wild may look different these days, but whether it's opting for a solo Friday binge watch or a big night out, everyone can indulge in their wild side with Pepsi Wild Cherry, also available in Zero Sugar. So grab a Pepsi Wild Cherry and get wild. Thanks for choosing this free Anfield Index podcast. If you'd prefer to listen to this or any of our other shows without adverts, then now's the time to check out Anfield Index Pro. With AI Pro, you can supercharge your entire listening experience. You'll not only get all of our podcasts without the ads, but you'll have them far faster with our quick publish feature available exclusively for subscribers. AI Pro also puts you in the heart of our sound studio with an option to listen to many of our shows live and interact with the podcasters in real time as the shows are recording. Upgrading couldn't be easier. AI Pro is available on all popular podcast platforms, and we have our own apps for Apple and Android. Just head on over to AnfieldIndexPro.com and get started today. Hello and welcome to the Daily Red, your lunchtime catch-up on all things Liverpool FC on a Thursday, on which we are approaching the weekend when we get back to real football and don't have to worry about international nonsense. Oh, it'll be good to have the Reds back. It really will be good to have the Reds back. And I think given what happened in the last game before the international break, we may well get a reinvigorated team. Now, there's going to be some tired legs, obviously, with players having played in the international shite, but I think there'll be players with a desire to prove a point. And that point is that we lost the United game. They didn't beat us. We beat ourselves. And when we return, I can see us putting together a nice little run here. We have some favourable fixtures coming up. Now, Brighton at home is tough enough because they're a good team. They're top eight in the Premier League. But at home, given some of their injury issues, given that their midfield has been... I'm not sure what the right word is. It's been decent. It's not been bad or anything. But it hasn't been settled. It hasn't been settled. There's been different players featuring in the midfield in the three positions the Zerbi likes to use, his double pivot and his 10. It's been a, a revolving door of players. Pascal Gross has played a lot, obviously. Billy Gilmore has played a lot, but Gross has played as the 10. He's played in the double pivot. He's played fullback. He's played wide. Gilmore has probably been the, the constant in that midfield. And... I like Billy Gilmore, but that's a significant downgrade from Alexis McAllister. And all the other options are a significant downgrade from Moises Caicedo. I was about three weeks ago, four weeks ago, I was bored. So I watched back the 3-0 defeat to Brighton last year down at the Amex. And I genuinely think that might be the best I've seen any team play against us. Like, they were genuinely brilliant on the day. And that midfield just tortured us. The McAllister Caicedo midfield absolutely dominated the game against us. Gave us nothing. They were phenomenal going forward. So incisive, so quick in their transitions. Both wingers had really good games. Matoma rinsed Trent. Solly March got two goals on the other side. Evan Ferguson was a constant pest up front. They had Gross at right back that day, and he was dictating play from there in a manner that we're similar to see, we're used to seeing from Trent. Uh, Lewis Dunk could still move then. He played quite well. Levi Colwell was excellent. 
they were just tremendous on the day. And we weren't. We really weren't at all. We had Salah, Gakbo and Ox as a front three. And they just looked completely disconnected from the rest of the team. The midfield was a farce. Henderson and Fabinho spent their game chasing shadows. Uh, We had no Virgil that day, which was a, a big factor, but obviously he wasn't having a great season either way. But it's noteworthy that we haven't beaten De Zerbe yet. Last season, they drew at Anfield 3-3. <clears throat> they wiped the floor with us in the league at the Amex. They beat us in the cup at the Amex. And this season, we drew at the Amex again. So, you know, four games, no wins for Liverpool. That needs to change this weekend. We need to win. We don't really have any choice. We have to win this game. Then we've got to play Sheffield United on the Thursday and we need to smack the life out of them. Then we go to Old Trafford and we need to win that game. Then it's Atalanta at home and Crystal Palace at home. They should both be wins. Win the first leg by a good enough margin. We can rotate for the second leg away. Then it's that run of three aways. Fulham. Everton and West Ham. Fulham are, I mean, we played them in the cup and we scraped by them in the league. They're a solid outfit. They get up for the big games. Marco Silva tends to have them very well prepared to play against the top teams. We've seen them draw at the Emirates and beat Arsenal at Craven Cottage this year. We saw them give us a really tough game at Anfield in the league and then in both cup games. But we should still be able to go there and win. And then it's the derby. And that's a really pivotal game. Especially considering they've screwed us on the West Ham fixture by making it an early kickoff. But if we get through both of those, then there's only three games left. And if we're top at that point with Spurs to come to Anfield, a trip to Villa, and then Wolves at Anfield, like you'd you'd really have to fancy our chances. But we just have to get to that point. And it's going to be tough because there's a lot of fixtures there. And if we get past Atalanta, there'll be two more lobbed in for Europa League semi-finals. I think they'd be the midweek between Spurs and Villa and then the midweek between Villa and Wolves. And then potentially there's a game after Wolves, which would be Europa League final in Dublin. So it's a lot of games, but we're getting players back. And that's really important at this time of the year. Trent is a couple of weeks away. Ali's a couple of weeks away. Jota couple of weeks away, maybe less, maybe a week for Jota. Curtis is back training. Gravenberg obviously was on the bench the last couple of games. Dans is back. Now, whether or not he'll play, I, I don't know. I think it would probably require some more injuries, maybe if, for Jaden Dans to get more opportunities. But you wouldn't be worried if he gets thrown on in a game because every time he's played, he's done well. He's made an impact. And we've been so fortunate this year with the young lads and how they've stepped up. And I say fortunate, but it's not really fortunate because we've prepared them for this. As a club, we've developed them well as footballers, but we've also developed them as men. Like, these are not kids, despite their age. They're going out there they they behave like they're savvy veterans. Like none of them appear in any way rattled by playing at Anfield. You know, a bunch of them came on in the cup final. Acted like they'd done it before. Jarrell Kwanzaa, from the first moment he came into the team, looked like he'd been there for years. Same goes for Connor Bradley. You're not in any way shaken if you see one or even both of them in our team. 
in fact, you're quite happy about it because they're good players. And more importantly, they're reliable players. In midfield, I mean, Bobby Clark, I think, has been excellent this year. I think James McConnell has done well in the opportunities he's had. And then the boys in attack, Dan's has been has been tremendous. I like what I've seen of Lewis Kumas. Now, I'm not quite sure what his long-term position would be, but we'll have a different manager, so him fitting ideally into a 4-3-3 isn't really an issue because we probably won't be playing that moving forward. And then other lads as well that have come in, like Ben Doak early in the season. At the end, product wasn't there, but very, very confident, always aggressive with the ball, looking to make things happen. We've obviously not seen much from this year, but Besetic last year, very, very confident, very calm, not rattled at all by the the moment, by the atmosphere, by the arena, by the opposition. It just kind of flows off all of these kids. They're just all able to lock in and focus. And I think big credit for that goes to, obviously, obviously to Jürgen, to Linders, to Vitor Matas. But I also think to the senior players in the team, led by Virgil, where they're just able to get these kids ready. They're able to make them feel at home. There isn't some hierarchy where the kids come in and they feel a little bit shunted to one side. They all seem to feel part of the group, and that's hugely important and wasn't always the case at Liverpool back down the years. Oftentimes, young players would come in and they'd be immediately kind of shunted into a corner and made to feel like, you're only here to watch us. You don't really belong here. But the culture that Jürgen has built at the club is such that now it's far more welcoming. And you'd imagine it's far more welcoming to not just the young players coming in, but players that come in from other clubs. And you see how quickly so many of them settle at Liverpool now. Remember back when Jürgen took over? when players would arrive, how long it seemed to take players to settle in. That's not the case anymore. Like People always say, oh, well, Robbo took six months to get in, Fabinho took six months to get in, so such and such will as well. It doesn't happen anymore. It just doesn't happen anymore. Lads come and they're just immediately at home. If you haven't seen it, the uh, A Day with Alexis, I think it's called, video on the Liverpool FC YouTube channel, uh, really, really well worth your while watching. Um, is it Ruby Deschamps is the girl's name? I think it's Ruby Deschamps. She spends time with Alexis and he just, you'll love him even more when you watch it. You genuinely will. He just comes across as the nicest lad in the world. On, Anf- uh, sorry, on this is Anfield. No new injuries, Anfield at its best. And four more things Liverpool need to win the league. So fully agree, obviously, on no more injuries, Anfield being at its best. What else does Adam Beatty have for us here? Arsenal and Man City to draw. Yeah, obviously, that's a good one. Agree with that. Eight wins from 10. Ooh. Eight wins from 10. Brighton, Sheffield United, Manchester United, Palace, Villa and Wolves. That's six. Beat Everton away, beat Pal- uh, sorry, beat, beat Fulham away. That would be eight. I still think we'd need a little bit more. Now, it might just be that we need two more points. Because Arsenal are going to drop points. If City draw with Arsenal, then they'll have dropped points there. There'll be three points behind them. Behind us, rather. We will we'll need them to drop points somewhere else if we're only going to win eight. But 
if Arsenal and City draw, we can afford to lose one as long as we keep our goal difference ahead of City's. It would be beautiful to win the title on goal difference. After losing it twice by a point, it would be beautiful to win it on goal difference. But I think they could easily drop points at home to Villa, away to Spurs. I think those are the two. And away to Brighton, I think, is tricky enough for them as well. It's definitely winnable for us. It's definitely winnable for us. So we play three top six teams. We play five mid-table teams, seven to 14th. And we play two of the bottom six. Arsenal, Arsenal play four top four uh, top six teams, four mid table teams, and two of the the bottom six. The difference is, other than them playing one more game against the top six, they have to go to City, they have to go to Spurs. Like United are top six in name only; they're not good. But second last game of the season, I wouldn't fancy going there knowing that you need to win because they're just the type of spawny team that will get a result against you. I'd rather be playing them when we're playing them because they might be a little bit full of themselves after beating us in the cup. City like us, it's a it's a 3-5-2 split between top six mid-table and bottom six. And their fixtures, as I said before, are a little bit easier. But I do think we've got a real shot here, especially if they drop points against City. I even wonder, would Arsenal winning be be a good outcome for us? Because I'd rather go toe-to-toe with Arsenal and have City four points behind than go toe-to-toe with City. Because I think there's multiple games there where Arsenal will drop points. I could see them dropping points at home to Chelsea, away to Brighton, at home to Villa, away to Wolves, away to Spurs, and away to United. I could see them dropping points in all of those. With City, it's only really three games. Um, Villa home. Villa home, maybe. Four games. But that's a lot less than Arsenal. Now, for us, Everton away. Villa away. Maybe West Ham away. That would concern me a little bit because it's the third of three games. But I think we'll win all five at home. And I think we'll go to... I think we'll go to Old Trafford and win. Uh, What else they got? Fords to keep firing. Absolutely. We need Mo to find form. We need Darwin to keep continue his form. We could do it getting Jota back. We could do it Diaz kicking on. He was showing some decent performances before the break. We could do it Gakbo getting his arse in gear. Uh, results away to enemies. And obviously, this is United and Everton. If we could win both of those, that would really put us in a great position. It really would put us in a great position. Uh, Anfield to be at its best, obviously. Yeah, that's a, <clears throat> a fine way to finish. Um, seven, sorry, five goals, seven assists, and sixteen hundred minutes. Liverpool in the March international break. That's not sixteen hundred minutes is a lot. I know we have a bunch of players, but still a lot. Um, okay, let's have a look at this one, and at this one, and uh, that one. Cuevin Callagher is outperforming Allison in crucial stat this season. Callagher has been excellent. He really has. Scotland manager ignored Jurgen Klopp request before Andy Robertson injury. Um, yeah, I mean, Steve Clark is a prick. So, you know. Pep and Linders could take Ajax job. He recommended Jordan Henderson transfer. Tremendous. Genuinely tremendous. Congrats to PSV and Feyenoord on their dominance of Dutch football over the coming three to four years. Um, 
Liverpool are said to be showing keen interest in a Ukrainian midfielder who has been described as one of his country's biggest talents with Red Scouts keeping an eye on the youngster. That is Georgi Sudikov of Shakhtar Donetsk. Now, it's Arthur Petrosian who's saying this. He doesn't really have the best track record. But Sudikov does look a very, very talented player. He's got a really high release clause, though, and it's certainly not something we would consider paying. Um, but he is he is very, very talented. I don't know how he fits. It would all depend, obviously, on a new ma- on who the new manager is. Um, he doesn't fit in a 4-3-3 with what we have already. He doesn't fit in a 3-4-3 with what we have already. He could fit really well in a box midfield in a four-box two with Darwin and Mo up front, him and Dominic as the advanced eights slash tens, Alexis plus a holding midfielder, and then Trent, Ibu, Virgil, and a new left back. But none of the managers were being linked with play a box midfield. So I don't know. Um, I also don't think we'll be, we, we'll obviously be looking at players all over, but I don't think we will be really going too far down the road on anybody until we know for certain who the new manager is going to be. Uh, Liverpool and Manchester United have announced a joint initiative against tragedy chanting. So that's really good to see and not before time. And then there's a piece by Sam Milne on Tommy Lawrence, a Liverpool legend, played obviously for us in the 60s. But there is a new book called Sweeper Keeper, and it tells the life story of Tommy Lawrence with the help of his family and those who knew him. And obviously, a lot of people won't remember him as a player, but will remember the clip when... A BBC journalist was walking around Liverpool just before a derby and bumped into him and asked him about the game and had no idea who he was. And you could just see that the, 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 Tommy Lawrence's eyes light up and it's a really, really nice video. Uh, on AnfieldIndex.com, there is a piece about Omar Marmouche, the Egyptian winger forward at Eintracht Frankfurt who we have been linked with a couple of times. Um, He's an interesting player, very, very talented. He'd be expensive and he wouldn't start for us, I don't think. I mean, it would depend on the system, I suppose. In a 4-3-3, I could see him starting off the left. But he'd be really expensive. Um... He's 25 now, to be fair. He's older than I thought he was. I would have concerns about buying anybody from Eintracht Frankfurt, to be totally honest, because the big money players that have left there in recent years haven't really done well. And I, I, I have no explanation for it, but go and look at the big sales from there over the last three, four, five years. It's more more failures than than hits. And that would concern me. There's a piece about Andy Robertson. There's a piece about the Liverpool midfield. A piece about Paul Joyce reporting that Ajax could potentially hire Linders. Piece about Luis Diaz. And then podcast wise, we have four new podcasts for you to listen to. Trev Downey and Dave Davis with a pro plus talking about some of the big decisions that the club are facing and the general football world as it stands. There's a new scout with myself and Carl having a chat about the upcoming Euros. There is a new Scouser Tommies with Jim and Jay, always a belter, so give that a listen. And then there's an international break under pressure. It is Dan Kennett and Cy Brundish. They've had a look at the last two months, injuries, returning players, et cetera, et cetera. Obviously, I, it goes without saying it's going to be really, really good because those boys are really, really good at what they do. So do make sure you listen to that. And that's it. That's all I have for today. So I will see you all tomorrow. Bye-bye. 
We hope you enjoyed listening to this Anfield Index show. Please be sure to subscribe to our channel so future podcasts find their way to your device automatically. There's nothing quite like fan engagement, and we'd love to know what you think of anything discussed on this show. The best way to get in touch is over on our free Discord community, where both podcasters and listeners debate the hottest LFC topics 24-7. Sign up free now at anfieldindex.com forward slash discord. You won't regret it. You can also follow us on Twitter at Anfield Index and find us on Facebook by searching for Anfield Index. Oh, and before you go, we'd love it if you could leave us a five-star review on your favourite podcast app. It only takes a couple of seconds and it means the world to the people who create these free shows. Sports Social Podcast Network.